Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Fairfax County Democratic Committee National Affairs Healthcare Forum that we have entitled, Oh Say Can You See, USPHC. USPHC is our acronym for Universal Single Payer Healthcare. This forum is being recorded. And it's extremely gratifying to see such a large audience attending tonight and know how many we have that who have registered and will attend to focus on this critical issue. I'm Sandra Clausen, the forum moderator and FCDC National Affairs Committee Chair. Our National Affairs Forums examine matters of national importance for the purpose of informing, engaging, and inspiring citizen action. I first want to recognize and thank all of those who contributed to organizing and promoting this forum, including my National Affairs Committee colleagues and the many Democratic Committee co-sponsors from across the Commonwealth of Virginia, including the Democratic Committees of Arlington County, Bristol, Virginia, Brunswick County, Culpeper County, Falls Church City, Floyd County, Franklin County, Hampton, Harrisonburg, Loudoun County, Lewinburg County, Madison County, Manassas and Manassas Park Cities, New Kent County, Newport News City, Norfolk City, Northampton County, Nottoway County, Prince Edward, Prince George County, Prince William County, and Roanoke County. A good amount of Democratic committees. Uh, we also want to thank our FCDC Executive Director, Jack Corrali, who's been managing our technology. And finally, Politico cartoonist, Matt Worker, who generously granted us permission to use his cartoon for our promotional graphic. Our program will be divided into two parts. In part one, our eight eminent panelists will deliver presentations laying out their ideas for the best route to move the United States from where we are now to a destination of universal health care coverage through single payer Medicare for all or other avenues. During their remarks, I encourage all forum attendees to write your questions for the respective speakers in the webinar Q&A box not the chat box. We will only be monitoring the Q&A box, not the chat, or not the raised hand emojis. Please specify to which speaker or speakers you are directing your questions. When the speakers conclude their formal remarks, we will proceed to part two, the Q&A, when I will ask a National Affairs Committee colleague to read some of your questions to the speakers from both the Q&A box and from those you submitted ahead in the form you received with your registration acknowledgement email. Okay, let's begin. The United States is a wealthy nation with a broken healthcare system. Among many similar reports, a Commonwealth Fund report ranked the US last out of six industrialized countries in health system performance, which included measures on quality, access, efficiency, equity of care, and healthy lives. Access and equity measures are affected by the lack of universal health care. On life expectancy, the US ranked 50th and below France, Canada, the UK, and the European Union average, according to the CIA World Factbook. Infant mortality is also higher in the US than in, in those countries and more. A report on infant mortality by the nonprofit Save the Children showed that the U.S. tied for next to last among industrialized countries. Yet, the World Health Organization has ranked the U.S. healthcare system first in the world in cost. We spend 17% of GDP on healthcare consumption compared to 9 to 11% of GDP in other wealthy countries that have far superior health outcomes than we do. We remain the only major industrial country without universal health care. Much of this expense is due to extremely high administrative costs because of the complexity of our multi-payer system. This complexity, complexity not only results in high costs, but also directly affects care. The COVID-19 pandemic glaringly exposed numerous deficiencies of our fragmented systems of health insurance, public health, 
drug and diagnostic testing development, approval, manufacturing and distribution, and health information. These problems left us vulnerable and have exacerbated the disastrous effects of the pandemic. The pandemic clearly revealed another threat to access, the dependence on employer-based health insurance for much of the population. Sudden unemployment forced millions of Americans to lose their employer-based health insurance at exactly the time that they needed it most. Furthermore, the millions of people without health insurance were among the most vulnerable to the pandemic. The vast inequality of incomes and wealth in the US directly affects access and quality of care with disproportionate impact on the poor and communities of color. Throughout the pandemic, our government has had to scurry to enact temporary legislation to remediate these systemic flaws. Data collected from the onset of the pandemic has also revealed that countries with universal single payer healthcare actually experience less severe cases and fewer deaths than those without. The pandemic has exposed the very limited resilience of the American system. We lack the national framework capacity that a universal healthcare system would provide to organize responses to major healthcare events at home and to manage infectious disease threats and health security globally. On a positive note, I'm pleased to report that the 2020 and 2016 Virginia Democratic Conventions endorsed as Virginia Democratic Party policy, the establishment of a universal single payer healthcare system such as Medicare for all. And polls and studies conducted across our country reveal continue to reveal actually that the majority of the public support implementing a universal healthcare system with substantial numbers preferring a single payer approach like Medicare for all. It's time for the United States to establish a system of universal healthcare. And our eight distinguished panelists are experts who can show us the way. To begin the discussion, it is my privilege to introduce Northern Virginia Congressman Don Beyer, first elected to Virginia's 8th District in 2014. He serves on the House Ways and Means Committee and the Science, Space, and Technology Committee as chair of the Subcommittee on Space and Aeronautics. He was also recently named chair of the Bicameral Bipartisan Joint Economic Committee and is a member also of the Progressive Congressional Progressive Caucus. Congressman Beyer is also a co-sponsor of H.R. 1976, the 2021 Medicare for All Act. Congressman Beyer, we are very eager to hear your ideas. Thank you, Sandra, very much. Thank you all for being here. And Sandra, thank you so much for working so diligently, conscientiously for many weeks or months to put this together. Um, your leadership on policy for FCDC and really for the country is, is really wonderful and, and I'm very grateful. And I'm honored to share the stage with uh, my wonderful colleagues, Bobby Scott and Pramila Jayapal, and with a world pan panel of world-class experts. Um, Bobby Scott, as you know, chairs the House Committee on Education and Labor. Uh, he's one of the, the great national leaders. And Pramila Jayapal, although she's been there two years fewer than I, um, leads the Progressive Caucus with um, a great deal of uh, clarity and values and strength and um, a very central player right now in all this going on with our president and our country. And we're here to talk today about universal health care, and I can't think of a better topic because it's something so desperately needed and long overdue. And Sandra, I am proud to be a co-sponsor of Congresswoman Jayapal's Medicare for All Act of 2021. When Pramila took over the leadership of that effort, the bill was more of an idea on paper, but she and her team have done a fantastic job turning it into something very concrete, clear legislative language, something that we can implement. And I'm proud of her leadership and dedication for making that happen. I've been a supporter of universal healthcare for a long, long time. I'm an army brat, so I grew up with healthcare um, through the military and just always expected it would be there. Um, but I've really been a supporter of a universal since I got to serve with um, Senator Bobby Scott in the U.S. Senate, starting back in January 1990. Back then, they had the Virginia Commission on um, the underinsured. It had a fancier name than that. But we were aware Senate. of... of in, the, in the state Senate. In the state Senate, yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 
I'm always promoting you or less. Um, but but and um, you know, we were studying it even then. We're in a state with that at that point seven seven and a half million people, and you had two two plus million without insurance. Uh, I had the incredible privilege to be ambassador to Switzerland under President Obama, so I get a chance to see their system firsthand. Um, everyone has health insurance, hundred percent. So that means they don't have any GoFundMe pages for cancer patients. They don't have people going bankrupt because of medical debt. Um, there are many better ways to fix our system. And that's never been more obvious than during COVID. You know, millions of Americans lost their jobs and lost their health insurance. And thankfully, many were able to transition to the Obamacare exchanges. But it became very apparent why tying healthcare to employment no longer makes sense. Relatedly, I was very proud that one of the things that Congress did early as part of the COVID response was to take up a bill I did with Congressman Courtney from Connecticut to make the vaccines free. Cost should never have been a limitation to accessing a free, life-saving COVID vaccine. And my gosh, if we could only overcome the vaccine hesitancy of the last 25%. You may have also seen that uh, I got a little attention recently introducing a bill to establish a vaccine or negative test requirement for boarding trains and planes domestically or working at the airport or the, or the train station, the Safe Travel Act. And we've been encouraging the president to do it by executive action. And I'm very proud of his aggressive vaccine responses and, and hope that he'll take these simple steps to keep us all safer when we travel. Because we've seen that other countries that have 80% of their population vaccinated, they no longer have to have the pesky requirements like masks. Just think of Denmark. One of my other legislative healthcare accomplishments I wanted to mention to you because nobody's heard of it um, is the reauthorization of PCORI. PCORI is the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. This was probably a Bobby Scott creation during the, the uh, Affordable Care Act creation back in 2008, because it was part of Obamacare to provide comparative effectiveness research, what really works best, but not based on a laboratory, based on what the patient says. And so all across the country, there are PCORI experiments right now. For example, in Inova Fairfax, they're comparing um, hip replacement on people over 65 with general uh, anesthesia or with local anesthesia. What works best? What has the better recovery? At other hospitals, they're comparing um, after heart surgery, what's better for blood thinning? Simple aspirin or some of the more expensive blood thinning drugs? Um, not surprisingly, some of these, uh, or surprisingly, some of these results are going to give us really great clarity in how we can hold down costs and even better, um, have better outcomes. So it was fun to lead the charge to reauthorize it. And right now, one of the biggest things we have is understanding how telehealth has been used during the pandemic and how we can better evaluate all of its strengths and some of its, some of its weaknesses also. One of the things that we did this past year was introduce a bill um, on long COVID and specifically taking advantage of PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Initiative, um, and uh, the, the, the CDC to gather all the information from the many, many people who are suffering from long COVID. Uh, virtually none of them have been vaccinated, um, but these 10% these that get the long COVID can have lingering system, symptoms for at least a year and maybe much, much longer. And many of the medical community having a hard time responding to long COVID because they don't really understand it. And that's what PCORI can help them do. So let's look at the action on the Hill currently. Um, I'm very proud of the, the reconciliation bill. It's taking a while to get it done, but I'm confident that um, almost everyone or every one of the 222 Democrats in the House and every one of the 50 in the Senate senators there will vote for it. Four key pieces, dental, vision, and hearing care for Medicare. Uh, that's a big, big improvement in health. Uh, a scary statistic I read, I hope it's not apocryphal, um, I didn't make it up, 20% of Americans over 65 have no teeth. You can just imagine what that's like when you have these huge dental problems and no dental care at all. It also includes the Elijah Cummings Lower Drug Cost Act, Now Act, which finally reels in drug pricing. It allows, allows Medicare um, not just to have to pay list price, but to actually negotiate the drugs. And it includes premium tax credits to make Obamacare plans more affordable. And finally, and really relevant, there's a, all a bunch of states that never expanded Medicaid. 
Terry McAuliffe fought for it his four years. Um, Governor Northam got a slightly better General Assembly and was able to get it passed. Uh, but there's all those non-expansion states. And sadly, the people that are most affected by not having Medicaid this, are usually people of color and certainly people who have very little money. They're, they're the, the, the lowest income among us. So there's a provision in Build Back Better to address that Medicaid gap. And there are lots of other um, things, maternal mortality, allowing seniors and individuals with disabilities to receive the services they need in their homes, and funding to protect the elderly and people with disabilities in nursing homes. So yeah, we're all waiting on the Senate. It's frustrating to wait for Senator Manson and Senator Sinema, <laughs> but um, we're gonna fight to keep the healthcare pieces especially in. I think everyone's greatest two priorities are number one, the environment, number two, healthcare. Uh, we've all compromised a little bit. We, we started off the year hoping that we could get the Medicare age down to 60. That's probably not gonna happen and build back better. But there are all other really, really good things that are going to make a difference. And the important part in Pramila's Medicare for All, tackling the pharmaceutical industry, is one of the things that's most at risk. Um, the far, big pharma is fighting very hard to take away the ability to negotiate drugs. And we can't afford to lose but three, three members in the House and only one in the Senate. So anything we can do to push that back up. Um, also this summer, Sometimes getting Medicare for all is inevitably going to be incremental. Hopefully it's fast incremental. But along the way, um, Congressman Gomez and Congressman Boyle and I introduced the Choose Medicare Act. It's parallel to what Tim Kaine has done in the Senate, which is if we can't get to Medicare for all overnight, let's keep making positive steps forward. In this case, Choose Medicare creates a new Medicare program, Part E, to establish a public option, something that we should have done in the Affordable Care Act, but uh, somehow retreated at the last minute. And it would allow every employer the ability to purchase, every employee to purchase into this Medicare program, employer to do it for their employees. Well, I'm very proud of the steps this administration has taken to finally tackle the pandemic, but much, much more needs to be done. And Texas reminds us, we can't take health care for granted. We've been lucky in Virginia to have strong Democratic governors right now, the only governor who's a physician in the country. Ralph Northam expanded Medicaid, and he and Terry McAuliffe have protected women's access to health care. And we've been very lucky to have the most progressive Democratic General Assembly in Virginia's history to pass long overdue basic policies. Sadly, that's all at stake in November here in Virginia. Uh, we have lots and lots of work to do in this next month. Remember, politics is a number game. Uh, when Joe Biden came and talked to the House caucus with Pramila and Bobby and me Friday night, you know, he went through the numbers, you know, the, the 222 to 213 or whatever in the House and 50-50 in the Senate. And we can have effective conversations on the federal level, but we've got to do it on the state too. So um, I appreciate your enthusiasm. All the people will give up a Thursday night to be here with us. You couldn't ask for a more impressive lineup of speakers, not including me. And I'm looking forward to learning from every one of them. And thank you for committing yourself wholly to making sure that every citizen in the wealthiest country in the history of mankind, one day soon, has the guaranteed right to health insurance. And with that, Sandra, I yield back. Thank you so much, uh, Congressman Beyer. Boy, do we agree with you on that. I really thank you for your remarks and we look forward to hearing more from you during the q and I'm now honored to introduce Congressman Bobby Scott representing the third congressional district of Virginia. He currently serves as the chair of the House Education and Labor Committee. As chair, Congressman Scott is leading the fight to improve equity in education, free students from the burdens of crippling college debt, protect and expand access to affordable health care, ensure workers have a safe workplace where they can earn a living wage free from discrimination and guarantee seniors have a secure and dignified retirement. He is also a co-sponsor of H.R. 1976, the 2021 Medicare for All Act. Congressman Scott. Thank you, Sandra, for your very kind introduction. And most of all, thank you for all the work that you've done putting this very important uh, program together. Um, I want to welcome everyone who's logged in to this evening's uh, Zoom to make, to make it so we can make it clear that healthcare is a right 
not a privilege. It ought to be a right just like it is in just about every other industrialized nation. Uh, of course, I'm pleased to be joined by my colleagues, uh, Don Beyer and uh, Congresswoman Jayapal, some of Congress's strongest advocates for universal health care. And we know there's a lot of work to be done to achieve universal health care in this country. And thankfully, we're making progress. Just last year, Congress was able to finally put an end to surprise billing, a practice that left too many patients price gouged in situations they could not help. And of course, in 2010, the Affordable Care Act took a monumental step towards improving coverage options and affordability for all Americans. After years of Republican obsession with repealing or dismantling the ACA, uh, we, I think they finally got that out of their system and Democrats have been able to focus on building on their progress. But Republicans really offer a choice. Uh, you, you know, they're, we're for health care and they're against it. When Medicare passed, the majority of the Republicans voted no. Uh, the uh, Republicans have refused in many states to expand Medicaid, even though, because there's a 90% federal match, it's virtually cost-free to the states, but they still won't expand it. And uh, the Republicans tried to, when they tried to repeal and replace uh, uh, Obamacare, CBO scored their plan and found that if their plan had become law, costs would go up the first year by 20%. Eventually, 20 some million pe fewer people would have insurance. Those with pre existing conditions would start losing their protections. And ultimately, the insurance you get will probably be worse than what you already have. And they actually passed it in the House. And but for John McCain's thumbs down, it would have become law. It would have passed the Senate and signed by the president. I mean, how do they actually do that with a straight face? But we are on the uh, on a path to, um, uh, to, to doing better. The American Rescue Plan passed earlier this year. As uh, Don said, we we're able to make the Affordable Care Act tax subsidies more generous and available to more people, a key piece to economic um, security for workers and families suffering in the wake of the pandemic. And so the fight to provide all Americans with basic health care as a right didn't begin this month or this year. It's a right Democrats have been fighting for decades. And we're working towards true universal coverage in a single payer system where every person would be guaranteed health care and a proposal, that's a proposal I've long supported. But we can do this gradually. One, one of the ways we can continue making progress is continue to reduce the maximum percentage. We reduced from about nine and a half percent to eight and a half percent in the last year, the maximum percentage you have to pay for your, um, for your health care under, under the Affordable Care Act, we need to continue investing to reduce uh, those numbers, and we need to add a public option. Uh, that's, a, that's a very viable option. When we were doing Obamacare, it passed the House and was within one vote in the Senate. Uh, it would have, uh, I, think, I think we could have adopted it in conference but Ted Kennedy died, was replaced um, by uh, Senator Brown, and we couldn't go back to the Senate in a, in, in a, in a conference committee. And so we were stuck with a bill without um, the public option. But it was interesting when the public option uh, was, uh, uh, was proposed, a Republican Senator, I won't name Senator Grassley from Iowa by name, but he said that the, um, uh, it was unfair competition. Well, what could he mean by that? Well, basically what he meant was that if you had a public option, it would be a lower cost and a better product. And that's unfair. I don't know unfair to who, but if that's his attitude, why don't we just vote and see who's, who's, who's on what side? But the reason it's unfair, quite frankly, is that the public option like uh, would not, would be at a government administrative rate like Medicare, spending about 3% on administrative costs. Whereas we had to pass a law to keep the private, uh, uh, the private premiums down to 20% administrative. They wanted to charge more than that. We said, you can't charge more than 20% for overhead, dividends, profits, high executive salaries. You had to live with 20%. 
And so that is unfair because they're, they're saddled trying to compete with a 20% drag. The public option would probably be on, on, on 3%, but that's why the public option uh, makes the most sense. Uh, and we could gradually, because it makes most sense, because it is a lower cost and better product, it would gradually become a single pair because everybody would be, uh, would be choosing it. Um, we've also uh, need to continue working uh, on reconciliation. There are a lot of, as uh, Don mentioned, there are a lot of um, uh, proposals in the Build Back Better plan, including uh, improving Medicare to include vision, hearing, and dental. These are quality of life issues that um, everybody ought to have access to. Expand subsidies to make coverage more affordable. We're going to make um, improve and get to try to get down as close gradually down to zero. So you'll have um, uh, the uh, um, universal coverage at, at no cost. Other initiatives like those who rely on home and community-based services uh, will get enhanced support. And finally, as Don mentioned, uh, I don't have to go into detail, lower the cost of prescriptive drugs. These investments will, will make will mean we'll be making meaningful process and we'll be on a clear path to a single payer universal coverage. Now we know our work is far from done. There are too many people struggling to access uh, their healthcare needs, but with continued progress, we can eventually achieve that goal. And with that in mind, I look forward to the panel of distinguished experts that you have um, assembled uh, to discuss this important issue. And I wanna thank you again for joining, for, for convening this important issue and look forward to my colleague, I just see her popped up, uh, Congresswoman uh, Jayapal. I look forward to her comments and the panel and thank you so much for putting this together. Thank you so much, Congressman Scott. We really appreciate your comments. Well, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal has joined us. And on behalf of my fellow Virginians, I want to welcome and thank the Congresswoman for visiting us virtually in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, Congresswoman Jayapal is serving her third term representing Washington's 7th District. Among her many roles, she's a member of the House Judiciary Committee, where she serves as vice chair of the Subcommittee on Antitrust, Commercial, and Administrative Law. She also serves on the House Education and Labor and Budget Committees and is the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Prior to serving elected office, Congresswoman Jayapal spent 20 years working internationally and domestically in global public health and development. She has worked extensively on healthcare issues as the lead sponsor of the Medicare for All bill in the House, HR 1976. Congresswoman Jayapal, welcome and please share your remarks with us. Thank you so much. And I love being with you virtually, uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and of course, with my distinguished colleagues, the chairman of the Education and Labor Committee, which I am so proud to be on and serve with Chairman Bobby Scott, and also my colleague, Don Beyer, who has been a wonderful Progressive Caucus member and uh, a tremendous leader in Congress. So I wanna thank you all for having me tonight. And I know many of the experts that are speaking here today, Don, it's great to see you, Bob Pollan, all people that we have worked with closely, uh, Dr. Don Berwick, of course, and I both, both served on the uh, Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force on Healthcare last year, which I uh, co-chaired with Dr. Vivek Murthy. So very thrilled to be with you today. And um, let me just say, I'm really excited about the ongoing fight for Medicare for All. I first introduced the Medicare for All Act in early 2020 after more than a year and a half of work with a broad coalition of partners on crafting really what was the first comprehensive Medicare for All bill in the House. We had, of course, for years before that, had a resolution for single payer health care, but there wasn't a comprehensive bill that took us through exactly what the transition would look like and what Medicare for All was in some detail. So the Medicare for All Act lays out a detailed plan that would transform the broken for-profit healthcare system into one that guarantees healthcare as a human right for everyone. And when we say everyone, we mean everyone, regardless of income, employment status, zip code, race, or immigration status. 
And when we say healthcare is a human right, we don't just mean that people should have some level of coverage. We actually mean comprehensive benefits with dental vision, mental health, reproductive health, long-term supports and services, benefits that people need to live their lives with dignity. And of course, all of this without co-pays, private insurance premiums, deductibles, or other cost sharing. Now, last term, working with our leadership, we were able to negotiate to hold the first ever hearings on the Medicare for All bill in the House of Representatives in all the major committees of jurisdiction. That was Ways and Means, Energy and Commerce, Budget, and Rules. And together with the overwhelming grassroots movement for health justice, we brought Medicare for All into the mainstream and made it a focal point of the Democratic presidential primary. Enactment of Medicare for All would mean that low-income families, working families, and those that have been denied health care for too long would finally receive the care that they desperately need. It would mean transforming our health care system to one in which patients see the doctor and leave without needing to pay a medical bill or have one arrive in the mail months later, causing financial stress. It would mean no more long calls with insurance companies to see if your doctor is in network or if your prescription will be covered. Really, it would mean that your health would be your first and only priority when seeking care with financial and administrative barriers to care eliminated. Now, by the end of last term, we were able to get half of the Democratic caucus to sign on to the bill, even as you all were pushing the resolutions that were supporting the bill in cities and states across the country. This March, exactly one year from when the first COVID-19 case was first identified in the United States, we reintroduced the Medicare for All Act of 2021. And this time it was alongside from the beginning, more than half of the Democratic caucus, including 14 powerful committee chairs. We have 117 co-sponsors. We have the backing of more than 300 local, state and national organizations. And we have the grassroots support of millions across the country. In the midst of a pandemic, the case for Medicare for All is clearer than ever before. Every other industrialized country realized long ago that you simply cannot tether healthcare to employment and that healthcare has to be guaranteed to everyone in order to have a thriving society. Yet in the United States, what we saw as the deadly COVID-19 pandemic caused people to lose their jobs, at least 27 million also lost their health care simply because they lost their job. Our fractured health care system caused a dangerously slow ramp up of COVID testing and vaccination. Even the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, alerted Congress to this issue early in the pandemic, explaining that the United States is not set up for universal testing or for other medical procedures as other countries are. As the pandemic progressed, our fragmented system further hampered public health measures to combat the virus because people delayed or avoided COVID tests or vaccines out of fear of huge medical bills. And today, people are now starting to see insurance companies say, we're not gonna cover those COVID costs anymore. So people are feeling bereft and without healthcare in the richest country in the world. While Medicare for All alone could not have addressed all the barriers and challenges brought forth by the COVID-19 pandemic, it is undeniable that would have largely strengthened our response and further enabled everyone to seek the necessary services with the health security that they deserve. As the pandemic worsened in 2020, there was a surge of support for Medicare for All from across the political spectrum with a 9% increase in support for the policy and an overall majority of voters in support. Even more interesting, 24% of Republicans responded that they were more likely to support universal health care after the emergence of COVID-19, indicating that the need for health care transcends party lines and is felt by everyone. In the wake of the devastation of COVID-19, it is clearer than ever that we cannot let up until we have a single payer Medicare for all system. Now in the meantime, as Chairman Scott said, we are pushing hard for inclusion of expanding Medicare in this Build Back Better Act. And that's why the Progressive Caucus made Medicare expansion one of our top five priorities. And that included expanding benefits to include dental, vision, and hearing coverage, 
lowering the age and of eligibility to at least 60 or 62, and making sure that we are allowing Medicare to negotiate the cost of prescription drugs. Now, Don Burbick and I, last year, we actually included many of these things into the recommendations of the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force, and those were accepted by President Biden. He has come out in support of lowering the age. He is obviously in support of expanding benefits, and he is very much in support of negotiating drug prices, not only for Medicare, by the way, but across all insurers. So the increase in support both inside and outside of Congress shows that we can do this. We can achieve real progressive steps that begin the transformation of our healthcare system as long as every single person across America stands with us, as long as organizers like the ones I'm talking to tonight are out there organizing to fight and to demand healthcare as a human right. I am grateful to every single one of you for the work you are doing to lift up stories, to build collective power, to build a broader, deeper, stronger movement to demand healthcare as a human right. And I'll be right here fighting inside of Congress for that exact same thing. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for all the work you're doing every single day. Thank you, Congresswoman. We are grateful that you could join us to offer your insights, but I also appreciate, I'm, I, I think I should mention that your schedule really isn't going to allow you to stay with us too long. And therefore um, we welcome you to stay as long as you can, but I know you have to go. So on behalf of your Virginia friends, thank you to your contributions to our forum deliberations. And thank you so much for your work to bring us universal single payer healthcare. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to the Commonwealth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we appreciate you very much. Okay, um, now let's see here. Let me move back up to um, our next speaker. Uh, okay, it is now with great pleasure that I introduce our next speaker, Dr. Donald Berwick. Dr. Berwick is one of the nation's leading authorities on healthcare quality and improvement. He is uh, President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Health Improvement, a former administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services appointed by President Obama, and lecturer in healthcare policy in the Department of Healthcare Policy at Harvard Medical Schools. Among many other roles, he has served as a member of the staffs of Boston Children's Hospital Medical Center and Massachusetts General Hospital. He has also served on the Board of Trustees of the American Hospital Association and Chair of the National Advisory Council of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and served on President Clinton's Advisory Commission on Consumer Protection and Quality in the healthcare industry. He is the recipient of numerous awards, the author or co-author of over 200 scientific articles and six books. Please welcome Dr. Berwick. Dr. Berwick, over to you. Thank you, Ms. Klassen. I really am delighted to be here and very honored to be in the company that you've pulled together here. I'll be brief, but uh, I just want to thank you for your, your leadership. And a tip of the hat, please, to Representative um, Bobby Scott and uh, Don Beyer and my friend and here heroine, uh, Pramila Jayapal. Getting to work with Representative Jayapal was one of the most inspiring experiences that I've had in contact with a public servant. Uh, we need people of immense courage today because the problems are so hard and the, the, the battle's so long and we have one uh, in Representative Jayapal. I just uh, admire her deeply. We're, we feel we owe her a lot. Uh, I should confess that I have been a fan of single payer health care since about 2013. I ran for governor in Massachusetts after I left CMS, I was so impressed with, with the opportunity to run Medicare and Medicaid, I felt we finally had an answer available. And I proposed single payer healthcare in the state of Massachusetts as a candidate. I did not win, uh, but the receptivity was already there. And I think thanks to the leadership of people like we have, the representatives that we have in this call, uh, there is a growing sense that something real, really important is possible here. I don't regard single payer care or Medicare for all or whatever your favorite term is as a religion, I, I don't think it has any ethical uh, heft. It's, it's not a good or bad thing, only with respect to what it gets done, because it's, it's not the point. The point is 
to improve in this country. And there are four goals that we need to achieve. They are universality. It is simply an embarrassment that we are in a country where anybody could go without health insurance and 30 million people do today. It should be zero. Uh, the, the, the worry that you're not gonna have health care is not worthy of a modern civilized nation. And it's time to stop admiring that problem and fix it once and for all. I got to be the administrator of CMS to implement the Affordable Care Act uh, in its first uh, 17 months. It was thrilling. We made a lot of progress, but we could have made a lot more and with more political support, we can get to universal. The second goal is improving quality of care. This is my personal and professional area. Uh, we have a de defective healthcare system that lets people down. I'll say without violating HIPAA, my own brother is in the hospital right now and I visit him every day, as often as I can, I speak to him every day. It's a mess. Very, very good people, but uh, systems that just don't work on behalf of the patient. They were set up for different purposes. Record systems that were set up for billing, uh, approval systems that make no sense, rules that nurses have to operate under that don't make any sense, and defect after defect after defect in the hands of a good workforce. We could have much better quality than we have today. And by the way, that would lower costs. Third is probably the biggest of all, and that's moving resources toward what are called social determinants of health. Healthcare does not create health. It cannot create health. It's a repair shop. But we know a ton scientifically about what does create uh, illness, what shortens lives, what creates vitality and well-being. There are a long list of things that does not include healthcare anywhere near the top. There are early childhood experiences. Uh, there's the quality and evenness and justice of our education systems. There's justice in the workplace. There's uh, programs for elder care and, and for reaching to, into people's homes when they're old so they are not lonely. And there's community infrastructures like food security and housing security and transportation security and, and recreational opportunities and criminal justice system that works and anti-racism. These are not healthcare uh, components and they are way under-resourced in our country compared to other countries and certainly compared to ideal. Healthcare is, we are funding the repair shop without funding the systems that actually make us healthy. That needs to change. It's costing us trillions of dollars not to put the money where the money could do some work, the right work. And finally, reducing cost. Uh, we are, as you said, uh, Ms. Klassen, you know, we're way too expensive. Uh, healthcare, in, I visit all over the world and many, many systems are functioning at half of our cost with much, much, much better outcomes documented not just by the Commonwealth Fund, but by many others. That's because we have a wasteful system that has administrative burdens, uh, nonsense in it, uh, greed, a tolerance of pricing behaviors that make no sense at all. And we just live with that and just pay the bill. And that bill is being paid by our workers. That's the only source of money for the American healthcare system is, is people who do work, the people in the, in the labor force. And we're taking their money and, give, and handing over to non-value added activities. Universality, better quality, social determinants, and lower cost. All of it's achievable, but it's achievable only if you have a brain. There has to be some mechanism in place that actually can can bring us attention, leadership attention, investment, uh, transparency, uh, initiatives, imagination to those efforts. Now, now, I ran Medicare and Medicaid, and I'll tell you, it can do it. I know it because I was there on, on, on universality. It was universal from the start. The one thing I never had to worry about was whether Medicare beneficiary had coverage. They had coverage by law. It was their right. I'd like to be able to say that of every single American. Uh, second, I could work on quality. On the short time I was able to be there before the Republicans insisted that I not be confirmed, I was the administrator, I had full powers, and we implemented uh, the largest program on patient safety in the history of the world, a $1 billion program to improve the safety of patients in our hospitals. We initiated programs to reduce heart attacks and strokes in cooperation with CDC. We could think about what to do and implement strategies to do that at a national scale. Private insurance can't do that. A fragmented insurance system, it can't do that. There's no brain, there's no central central leadership. We can see it in the opioid epidemic. We do not have a, a healthcare payer initiative that is intended to and held accountable for stopping the opioid epidemic. If we had single payer healthcare, we could. We could make that a national goal. On the front of, of uh, social determinants of health, the Affordable Care Act put a lot of tools in our hands to do things like help people stay at home, to reach out with special resources for them, not by any means enough. But if you think the private insurance industry is going to shift resources toward education of young children or food security or housing security as a major strategic initiative, you're in a country I'm not in. I, I don't see that happening. Yet the government can do it. We can do it through a single payer consolidated system that makes a, a conscious decision to shift resources to keep people healthy. 
And finally, reducing cost. Medicare cost growth has been slower than any other part of the healthcare payment economy. I believe Judy Fader may, connect, may correct me. But beyond that, I can see the waste. I can see what we can do about it. And I know that we could reduce our costs. I would target 15% of GDP. It's a perfectly agreeable amount that this country could get by with. It'll never happen in a profit-driven uh, coverage system. It has to be done with a plan, with an intention to do that. I work in countries all over the world which have a brain with respect to managing healthcare. They make decisions. I'm working with the country of Singapore, which is launching a massive national effort to finally get diabetes under control. I work with the UK, as was held against me when I was, when I was uh, 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 administrator of CMS. But I can see, for all the faults, the integrated systems developing in the UK and doing far better work on well-being in the nation than we can in this country. Um, we could do it. We just have to decide to do it. And the kind of leadership we need to recruit is going to have to be very strong. People like the congressman, people on the, on the call today, who finally say it's time. It's time to stop wasting the money. It's time to stop tolerating the quality effects. It's time to stop, stop letting greed run the system. It's time to stop investing where health can be found. And it's time to promise everybody that they can have health care. Um, is Medicare perfect? Absolutely not. Believe me, I know more than anybody on this screen about the problems of running a public health system. It's not perfect. But I'll take it in a minute over the chaotic, costly, uh, exclusive system that we have today. Thanks a lot for the chance to comment, uh, Sandy. Thank you so much, Dr. Berwick. I'm, again, eager to hear when we get to Q&A uh, further of your comments. Um, our next speaker is Professor Robert Polan, uh, whom I am delighted to introduce. Dr. Uh, Professor Polan is the Distinguished University Professor of Economics and co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He has worked extensively on the economics of single payer healthcare in the United States. In May, 2017, he co-authored Economic Analysis of the Healthy California Single Payer Healthcare Proposal. And in November to 2018, he co-authored Economic Analysis of Medicare for All, which was right, is widely regarded as the seminal work on the topic. He has also worked as, as a consultant for the US Department of Energy, the International Labor Organization, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and numerous non-governmental organizations in several countries and in the United States and municipalities on building high employment green economies, on creating living wage statutes, and on financial regulatory policies. Professor Poland, please proceed. Uh, Right. Thank okay. you very much, uh, Sandra. I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, I am uh, really appreciated hearing the comments of our members of Congress. Don Berwick is somebody that I worked uh, pretty closely with when we did our study in 2018 that was requested by Senator Sanders. Um, Don Berwick gave us some uh, very constructive criticisms. And if you're interested, they're all posted online along with comments from many, many other people. Um, so I'm gonna just give some uh, basic economic uh, perspectives. And the fact of the matter is the economics of establishing a single payer healthcare system in the United States in its basics is actually simple. It's quite simple, the basics. So let's just say, I'll, I'm going to reiterate a lot of what we've already heard and maybe do it in a way uh, more economics -y, more numbers focused, but okay. Uh, Medicare for all, or again, whatever you want to call it, uh, Medicare for all can deliver good quality care for all, everyone in the United States, all residents, and it can do it while reducing overall healthcare costs. Uh, by reducing overall healthcare costs in the range of 10% or more. 10% actually is a low end estimate and I'll explain that more in just a second. If we even go with the 10% number, the low end estimate of reduced costs, you know, uh, what that means on average is that everybody who's spending money on healthcare today every individual, every family, and every business will spend 10% less and everyone will get 
better coverage. Uh, nobody will face uh, financial stress, financial ruin. And of course, during COVID, as, as other people have already uh, described so well, uh, this was incredibly stressful period for people facing uh, job layoffs, uh, loss of health insurance, and the threat of uh, getting uh, infected with COVID. Um, all of that, at least the financial features of that, can be utterly eliminated through the implementation of some kind of uh, Medicare for all system. Now, all of those things sound like very, very strong assertions uh, that um, maybe in an academic type discussion, we would say, well, you need to qualify this. How do you know any of this is really true? And I would love to be able to say that, that you know, the 200 page study that uh, Sandra referred to, I appreciate the reference. I would love to be able to say that everything in my research was so original and I came up with all kinds of new findings that no one had ever thought of before and that I demonstrated how we can achieve universal good quality coverage at lower cost. The fact of the matter is there was not a single original thing in my entire study. Uh, basically all we did was review the evidence that is before our eyes that is obvious uh, and has actually been referred to now multiple times by other people. That is, uh, when we compare the United States healthcare system with that of other advanced countries, and I should say other advanced capitalist countries. So we're not talking about uh, transitioning to a socialist economy uh, by implementing Medicare for all. We're talking about creating a system of universal healthcare that delivers care at uh, high quality and lower cost specifically. So in the United States, we're spending on average about $11,000 per person. <coughs> and that comes to about 17% uh, of GDP. So almost 20% of all the economic activity in this country is targeted at delivering healthcare. That's $3.3 trillion. Uh, the other advanced economies on average we spend about $11,000 per person. They spend on average 5,700 per person. So about 40% less per person. That amounts to about nine to 11% of GDP. Now, even if we take the high end number like Germany at 11% of GDP and, and compare that with our 17% of GDP, that's six percentage points of GDP, of gross domestic product, of overall economic activity. In the United States, that six percentage points of economic activity is equal to $1.3 trillion. So even by this very simple, modest metric, we are wasting $1.3 trillion every year uh, by having a wasteful, healthcare system that does not in turn even deliver uh, well-being. And we've already heard evidence on that. I'll just refer briefly, uh, you know, uh, uh, measuring medically preventable deaths, United States ranks 34th in the world. Uh, our medically preventable deaths are about 30% higher than Germany and the UK. They're 80% higher than France. Okay, now, there are, as, as uh, Dr. Berwick went through very well, uh, there are reasons for our poor performance overall in terms of health outcomes that go beyond healthcare coverage, but healthcare coverage is a significant part of the overall story. And as we've heard also, we have nearly 30 million people, um, about 11% of the population under 65 that remains uninsured. On top of that, we have almost 90 million people, 33% uh, of the under 65 population that we could call underinsured. And what do we mean by underinsured? Well, uh, somebody referred already to the ex excellent work done by the Commonwealth Fund. I wanna refer to some of their statistics very briefly. Uh, <clears throat> they have four indicators of access problems to healthcare in the United States. 
And these are uh, issues that are applying now to people who do have health insurance. Number one, they have health insurance, but they did not fill a prescription. Number two, they have health insurance, but they skipped a recommended test, treatment, or follow-up. Number three, they had health insurance, but they did not visit a doctor or a clinic, even though they had a problem. Number four, uh, they were recommended to see a specialist. They didn't go with health insurance. Why didn't they do these things that were recommended? Uh, they did it because they couldn't afford the deductibles, the co-pays were prohibitively high. They would lead them into uh, serious financial distress. And these are people, again, that have health insurance. Okay, now what does Medicare for all do? How do we cover everyone and lower costs? When we cover everyone, so when we cover everyone fully, there's no such thing as underinsured. Everyone has equal access to all the features of the system. And so that we are going to integrate uh, both the roughly 30 million people who are uninsured and the roughly 90 million people who are underinsured, we're going to allow all of them to have full coverage. Uh, that's adding uh, either from zero coverage or partial coverage to full coverage, that's adding 120 million people into the system, okay? So that is a massive expansion in the extent of coverage, precisely because the degree of coverage now is so inadequate. And costs will go up because we are covering people who are right now not covered. So the costs per person uh, are going to go up because we're giving the provision of care to these people. That said, that said, uh, the overall system costs are still going to go down. Now, how does that trick happen? Okay, when we cover everyone adequately, or no, I shouldn't say adequate, when, we, when everyone is able to access good quality care, according to research that I've done uh, and with my co-authors, the system-wide costs will go up by about 12%. My estimate of this 12% cost increase actually is on the high end. It's on the, if you look at the research literature, uh, uh, other researchers, including uh, the researchers at the Mercatus Institute, uh, the Koch Brothers Founded Institute at George Mason University, their number for the increased cost is actually lower than mine. And I, I deliberately estimated a high end figure because I certainly didn't want to underestimate how much it would cost to give good coverage to everybody. So we're going to increase costs per person by putting everybody into the system with good quality care. Nevertheless, we estimate that the overall system costs, as I said at the beginning, are going to go down 10% roughly. And why is that? Because as we've just heard uh, in uh, previous speakers, we have uh, huge sources of wasteful spending in the system. The two biggest ones are, uh, number one, administrative costs. Uh, with the private health insurance system, the costs of contracting, claims processing, credentialing providers, payment validation uh, are driving up the costs in, in, in addition to the role of profitability and the role of advertising in the private health insurance system, such that the hot private insurers spend about 12% of overall system costs on it, what they call administration, whereas existing Medicare spends 2%. That is a 10% differential in a $3 trillion system. That's $300 billion right there. Now, I did notice in the chat at some point, somebody said, well, the Medicare system administrative structure is inefficient. Uh, of course, there are inefficiencies there, and of course, if they can be improved, but in comparison with the private healthcare system, there is uh, dramatically lower costs delivering uh, better uh, healthcare uh, results. The second uh, big area of cost reduction as has already been mentioned, is drug prices. Uh, and as, uh, as we've heard, uh, the US 
is uh, spending about uh, twice the number per, per uh, prescription drug, particular per prescription drug, the costs of the US are about twice as high as the average in the other advanced economies. Uh, this has been demonstrated over and over again in research, including looking at research that looks at uh, the top 10 uh, most heavily uh, spent uh, pre prescription drugs, specific prescription drugs in say uh, the other advanced economies versus the US. We're just spending more for the exact same uh, medications in this country. And so that establishing a system where we control costs, where we force down the costs of the prescription drugs rather than allowing the pharmaceutical companies to set prices where they want to, uh, can lead to massive cost savings uh, in terms of the healthcare delivery. So that's how we are able to uh, uh, produce under Medicare for All, a system where right now we have roughly 120 million people not getting adequate coverage, where we provide adequate to good coverage for everybody, and we lower costs uh, by consolidating under the single payer system. Uh, and as I said, on average, it's about 10% cost. Now, the last thing I would say for now is that our, our tax is gonna go up as a result of this. Yes, taxes will go up, but spending will go down, okay? That's very straightforward. The reason is that we are no longer gonna be spending money uh, giving money to private health insurance companies. Instead, we're gonna be spending less per person uh, by uh, paying the taxes. And if we want, when we go into the discussion, I can talk about various tax ways to establish the taxes in order to ensure that the, that the cost payments are gonna be uh, fair across the board. Thank you so much, Professor. Really appreciate it. Um, now we're moving on and I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Susan Rogers. Dr. Rogers is president of Physicians for a National Health Program, which is a national organization whose mission is to advocate for single payer Medicare for all. Dr. Rogers received her medical degree from the University of Illinois College of Medicine and completed her residency in internal medicine at Cook County Hospital. She has spent almost all of her career at Stroger Hospital of Cook County, where she was a primary care physician in one of the neighborhood clinics before becoming a hospitalist and director of medical, medical student programs for the Department of Medicine. She is an assistant professor of medicine at Rush University in Chicago, past co-president of Healthcare for All Illinois, previous medical director of the Near North Health Service Corps in Chicago. Dr. Rogers is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and a member of the National Medical Association. Uh, Dr. Rogers, uh, would you please offer your remarks? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Sandra. And I am, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel and thank you for putting all this together. I'm quite honored to be here included in this panel. And I want to say that I am not a policy expert. I have been a clinician almost for my entire career, despite having some administrative uh, responsibilities. And working at Cook County Hospital for almost all of that time, I have seen firsthand the disastrous human toll that gets the human cost that gets paid because of people who don't, because of people, because people don't have insurance and cannot access care in a timely way. Now, I, we, I like to share my thoughts about why we need Medicare for all, because this is a system that does not make certain that all residents have access. And that is the whole purpose of a Medicare for all. We all have to have access. We need preventive care when we're healthy, and curative care when we're sick. Now, despite spending two to three times more than every other industrialized nation, we have the worst outcomes of many of the parameters that the World Health Organization monitors. Our life expectancy is worse, our infant and maternal mortality rates resemble those of a third world country rather than the industrialized nations that we compare ourselves to. 
And even if we compare socioeconomic groups, wealthier people live longer in Europe and industrialized nations than wealthier people here in the United States. Poor people in industrialized nations live longer than poor people who live here. So everyone, regardless of their socioeconomic level, would benefit from a Medicare for all system. So these outcomes are due to our healthcare system here that is motivated by profit rather than motivating to improve everyone's care. Now health insurance, whether it is private health insurance from an employer or government subsidized insurance through the exchange or Medicaid or Medicare, it is there to provide access to care to help prevent financial distress and bankruptcy. But our current system doesn't do these things for most people. The insurance card that many of us carry in our wallet is nothing more than a donor card to the insurance company because we are not able to access the insurance that we are entitled to because of out of, out of the uh, skyrocketing deductibles and copays and other out-of-pocket costs. So in discussions that I hear and things that I read, things often seem to focus on the cost and the word, we have to make it more affordable, the saying we have to make it more affordable keeps coming up. Well, yes, we definitely need to rein in the cost, there's no question. But what does more affordable mean? Studies show that most Americans can't afford an unexpected $400 expense. So what does affordable mean for those that are homeless or living in concentrated poverty? There is no number that is affordable for them. What is affordable for frontline and essential workers who work every day for a poverty level income without health benefits or even paid sick time? There is no number that is affordable for them. For those living in Medicaid non-expansion states, there is no number that is affordable for them. For the disabled adult who relies on Medicaid for their medical care, who cannot work because they will then lose their Medicaid health benefits is doomed to poverty so they can get their health care benefits paid. What is affordable to them? The United States is the only country that has a separate health care system for poor people. And even that does not take care of everyone who is poor. But it, is the only, but it is only people living in poverty that often find, it is not only people living in poverty that find medical bills unaffordable. Over a fourth of GoFundMe campaigns are for medical bills from people who are employed or have insurance. Two thirds of bankruptcies are related to loss of wages because of illness and benefits and illness and medical bills. Patients are often hit with surprise bills they cannot pay because they thought a service was covered and was later denied, for their, denied by their insurance company. What is affordable for them? Now, as policymakers must acknowledge how life varies for all of us, our race and ethnicity, where we live, our educational levels, our income, all of these things affect every aspect of our life. And with attempts to fix our dysfunctional healthcare system, we need to acknowledge these differences in what people have and don't have, what they need and don't need, while also acknowledging the similarities because there are things that we all need, like healthcare. We hear public health announcements to suggest people talk to their doctor about the vaccine. But we have to acknowledge that many people do not have a doctor to talk to. We must acknowledge that many people do not have a car to enable them to go through a drive through vaccine or testing site. We must acknowledge that many neighborhoods do not have a hospital or even a pharmacy. Yet policies to improve healthcare access and service are often proposed without acknowledging or addressing these inequities. We can't make policies that treat groups as if they don't exist, as if they are invisible. But that is what clearly happens when we talk about just make it more affordable. We have to make health care available to everyone. We must now acknowledge those who may still have difficulties when proposing solutions. We can make, not make policies that further disenfranchise groups because it remains unaffordable still. 
Now it's well documented about the high out-of-pocket out of costs that several other panelists have already mentioned. There are drugs that cost thousands of dollars a month, not because of a need of pharma to recoup research dollars that they never even spent because the NIH already paid for it with our tax dollars, but they cost that much because big pharma is allowed to do that. They are allowed to charge whatever they want. The current deductibles created to make patients have more skin in the game do nothing but reduce the use of needed care. Insurance plans continue to make money every month off of premiums while the insured can't access the needed care because they cannot afford that deductible and other out-of-pocket expenses. So having an affordable health plan that is unusable because of these out-of-pocket costs is no different from having a car without the keys. Both are unusable and both are not affordable. So this is what is wrong with the basic foundation it's our for-profit healthcare system. A for-profit system will never be accessible or affordable to everyone, no matter what we do to lower costs. Knowing that we all will need access for healthcare for various needs throughout our lives, we have to have a healthcare system that is accessible financially and geographically. We need to look at how other industrialized nations have better outcomes so that we can see that there is a better, a more affordable way to provide healthcare access for everyone and live longer lives. They have a universal healthcare system in those countries. We cannot fix a dysfunctional system when it is built on a broken foundation. Medicare for all referred to also a single payer system because the government will be the single payer of health costs of healthcare costs will provide health care where it is needed, not where it will make a profit. It would be funded with progressive taxes based on income for those who work and other taxes that others may pay, which is okay. I pay taxes that support the school system, even though my children are, long, are no longer in school. We all pay for taxes, even if we do not directly benefit. So although a new tax would pay for this, it does eliminate the insurance premium, the co-pays and the deductibles so that everyone would actually be spending less. That is what I call affordable. Elimination of the outrageous administrative costs for insurance and provided billing, the denial of care, the marketing of thousands of different and difficult to understand plans would lower overall costs tremendously. And although future illnesses or injuries can never be predicted or foreseen, with Medicare for all, they would never throw anyone into bankruptcy because of unexpected medical costs as they do now. The care for those unexpected healthcare costs would be covered. Hospitals would have global budgets that will provide all necessary care, and they would be placed where they were needed, like firehouses, not where they can produce a fire, not where they can produce a profit. Currently, we have medical deserts because the present system of financing healthcare can't sustain hospitals or clinics in poor and rural communities. Over 160 rural hospitals have closed since 2005, and there are now rural counties without a single obstetrician. We cannot continue to reach for the non-existent affordability of healthcare under a for-profit system that is based on private insurance companies without any regulation of pricing that we don't do now. We need to focus on a fair, equitable Medicare for all system that would place services where they are needed. Multiple economists in the Congressional Budget Office have shown and proven over and over that this can be done. We need Medicare for all. Everyone would be covered from birth to death for all medically necessary services. And the majority of physicians, even some of the highest paid subspecialists support Medicare for all as do many large medical societies. So if we insist on finding a way to be affordable, Medicare for all is the way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rogers. I really appreciate that. Our next panelist is NOVA's own Professor Judy Fader. Judy Fader is a professor of public policy 
and from 1999 to 2008, served as Dean of what is now the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. A nationally recognized leader in health policy, Judy has made her mark on the nation's health insurance system through both scholarship and public service. Not only is she a widely published scholar, but Judy has also served as congressional staff and as a deputy assistant secretary at HHS. In 2006 and 2008, Judy was the Democratic nominee for Congress in Virginia's 11th congressional district. Judy is a political scientist with a BA from Brandeis University and a master's and PhD from Harvard University. Uh, Professor Fader, over to you. Thank you, Sandra. It's what a, how great to be with you and what a great forum. The energy here and the commitment of people to changing what we know is a failed health insurance system, health care system, um, is powerful. And I um, think that everyone here agrees that the system we have is failing us. What we need to think about, and I'm going to shift the tone just a bit, is how do we get from where we are to where we all agree we wanna go? Um, we know what's wrong with our system, that it doesn't guarantee affordable, available, as Dr. Rogers said, meaningful health insurance to people to get them care when they need it. And it sure as hell doesn't make our costs manageable. Um, but we also know that for decades, we have had failed or limited health reform because most of us who have health insurance can be easily scared into thinking that bringing everybody into the kind of system that people have described as a single payer system, that with that, they're somehow gonna lose rather than gain. Now, I don't think anybody on this call shares that view, but unfortunately, that fear has made it very difficult to move our system in the direction that we'd all like to go. The question I'd raise for everybody is whether and how much that's changing, how much people are becoming increasingly discontent with the kind of system that we have. Employer-sponsored insurance, which is what most of us count on, is covering less and costing us more, as many have said tonight, leaving millions more underinsured in what is supposedly, or what we have treated as the kind of health insurance that people should be able to count on. And consumers of all income levels are increasingly incensed with unacceptable drug costs, surprise bills, and complicated insurance choices that essentially leave us with no choice of the doctor that we would like to have when we are ill. Now, I don't think that the opposition to, the, to change, despite this growing discontent, has gone away. But I do think that we can move right now in this administration to build on, use and mobilize that discontent, to build a government managed system until or even while we have multiple payers in the system. So how would we do that? Well, number one, I believe we have to continue to make noise about what's wrong with what we've got. It took years and a lot of work to show and demonstrate that people had a problem with, um, with pre-existing conditions. that They couldn't get insurance. It took years to convince people, to convince the political world that insurance matters that without health insurance, you don't get access to care. Now we have to continue that exposure, demonstrating the, the rising costs of prescription drugs, EpiPens being a prime example. The COVID costs, the, epi, the pandemic has exposed tremendous weaknesses and failures in our systems and COVID costs 
are continuing and will increasingly go uncovered. And the complexity and the challenges of navigating our current system with constant changes insurers where the doctor you had is no longer covered by the plan your employer or someone else has put you in. So we gotta make noise is number one and continue to document that the system fails us. Second, we have to build confidence in using our federal government's capacity to address these problems. The Affordable Care Act was a very modest, albeit very valuable and hugely, a, a huge accomplishment as a healthcare reform. But it did a lot more than establish a website, which many of us will remember, we couldn't even make work at the outside. The, the Affordable Care Act actually established national authority over much of our health insurance system. The capacity or the authority to oversee private payers, assure that they deliver what they promise to deliver, make clear what consumers are, can expect when they choose a health plan, and facilitate, if not impede, access to care. But we didn't ever use that authority. We were short in the Obama administration of the resources to do it. And so it's under such attack politically that there wasn't the wherewithal to actually administer that law the way it can be administered. That can and ch change and is changing now, but we need to push the Biden administration to go to use all they've got to act effectively. And we need new authorities in order to strengthen what was in the original Affordable Care Act, making permanent the ARPA improvements in the subsidies for that are in the ACA. And I would highlight as a key um, action we need to take to start regulating prices, starting with drugs, which is a part of the reconciliation proposal that is now on the table. That can launch a, a movement to recognize that we need public authority over what providers are getting paid to prevent the, the, the waste that so many and overpayment that so many have highlighted. And finally, I cannot leave an FCDC conversation without saying that we're, if we're gonna get from here to there or get anywhere, we need to get out there and win. We need to win the election that's coming up in a few weeks to demonstrate to the nation that we are on the march. That's that, we need to do that. And we need in the, in the, to re-elect a, a Biden administration and a Congress that is made up of Democrats like those who are on this call, who are committed to a government that it, whose purpose is purpose is to deliver to our communities the services that we need. So go get them, FCDC. Thank you so much, Professor Fader. Very much appreciate those remarks. You're absolutely on point. I do want to make a correction. One of my colleagues, while you were speaking, sent me a text to say that when I introduced you, I had misspoken and said you ran for CD11, which of course, since yeah. I'm from, I know, yeah. I know. And I had <laughs> in the notes, I, I have written CD10, but you know, since I'm CD11, I must have had it on my mind. So my yeah. correction, you ran for CD10, and I appreciate my colleague letting me know I misspoke so I could correct it. Thanks so much. Now, uh, our final expert panelist is Melinda St. Louis. Melinda is the Director of Public Citizens Medicare for All campaign. For the past 20 years, Melinda has led multiple campaigns that challenge corporate power and promote economic justice and human rights. She received her master's degree in public policy from Georgetown University. Do we have you with us, Melinda? I am here. Over to you. 
Hello, uh, it, it's a pleasure to, to be on this incredibly impressive panel. And I am also, I'm very uh, thrilled to, also, to get to see you, Professor Fader, uh, who I was uh, at Georgetown Public Policy Institute many years ago. So thrilled to be able to uh, join you on this panel as well. Um, and as well as obviously to to share the share the Zoom with uh, with Representative Byer and Scott and uh, Jai Paul, my hero as well. So, I uh, you know I think at this point I'm you know I've I've been honored to be a part of this impressive panel. Uh, I think what's been made clear on the panel is that. Medicare for all is clearly the solution uh, to our inequitable and expensive and inefficient system. I and I think all of the points I was planning to make have been powerfully made already, so I don't want to get into them deeply. You know, I think the fact is that the COVID-19 pandemic laid bare the long-standing failures of our current system. You know, we saw private insurers profiting. Uh, at the time, while they're limiting access to care, we saw you. There's very you don't need to know much more uh, about the system than when you see during a global pandemic when people are when hospitals don't have enough PPE for their uh, for their uh, health providers and um, and and then we see private insurers banking record profits quarter over quarter during a global health pandemic, you can see how perverse the incentives in our current system are. Obviously, millions of people losing their insurance when they lose their jobs. Again, during a global pandemic, what could be more perverse than that? Um, seeing that hospitals and nursing homes having incentives to focus on profit and revenue over patient well-being that led to vast um, of spread of COVID um, in, in, among seniors and also um, hospitals unable to respond in the way that um, was needed in many, in many areas of the country. Our, our public health preparedness system lacking adequate funding because we've put so much effort into the uh, and, and funding into the profit making side of healthcare and and starving our public health system uh, for years and uh, and and obviously the massive health disparities that have been talked about um, that predate COVID but that set up this um, the the massive um, disparities of what we saw in terms of COVID cases, deaths among um, people of color, particular disproportionate, et cetera. Um, you know, the other important points around how Medicare for all is really the only healthcare system that we could, that we can envision here that would actually have patient choice. You know, we talk a lot about choice um, and, and spreading misinformation about Medicare for all, but what people want to be able to choose is their doctor. And with Medicare for all, there would be no in-network anymore. Everybody in-network or out-of-network, everyone would be in-network under Medicare for all. So vastly more choice under Medicare for all. Can we afford Medicare for all? We can't afford the status quo. That is, I think, very clear from what uh, Professor Pollan said. We would save trillions overall um, in our uh, overall system and families, importantly, would be, except for the very, very wealthy, would be paying far less on healthcare when, than what they're currently paying. And, you know, and on and on. So I think the other panelists really made those points powerfully. And I just want to, to echo them. What I want to say is, and to agree with Professor Fader as well, is that this is a political question. We, you know, the facts, you know, I think we have the facts on our side, we have the morality on our side, but what we need to do is change the politics of this. And that's what you know, Public Citizen has been advocating along with um, our partners, Physicians for National Health Program, um, other health, labor, business organizations, faith community, community organizations to build the base of support that we're going to need in order to be able to, to really challenge the strong corporate influence and power that is maintaining the status quo. The private insurance companies, big pharma, the large for-profit hospitals that are spending enormous sums of money to lobby on both sides of the aisle to um, against um, real reform on lots of issues and particularly 
on single payer health care because they do they want to protect those billions in profit. And that's why the way we win is to build a massive grassroots movement powerful enough to over overcome the influence of those corporations. So um, just a, a, a few things I just wanted to kind of get to the movement building side of, of this. We and a host of partner organizations that represent doctors, nurses, patients, workers, small business owners, community organizers are working across the country to build local coalitions to educate their neighbors and the local media about Medicare for All in order to counter all of the misinformation and lies that are being spread um, by the for-profit health industry and to develop pressure campaigns to convince their elected representatives to sign on as co-sponsors co to the Medicare for All bills like um, the representatives on this call and to move the Medicare expansion pieces that we've talked about and build back better over the finish line to hold a representative accountable if they're, if they're blocking important reforms. So building those local coalitions. And one powerful tactic that um, local organizers have been employing across the country is to involve municipal governments as well. And I think that's relevant you know, to the folks who are part of this, uh, of this discussion of, across Virginia. All across the country, city and town councils and county boards are passing resolutions in support of Medicare for All. Um, it pars part of the reason for that is that local governments do play an important role in highlighting the desperate need for an expanded and improved Medicare for All system because they understand all too well the consequences of our unaffordable and inequitable health insurance system. Municipal buz budgets are increasingly strapped as, their, as health insurance premiums are increasing for municipal employees. Local businesses are struggling to make ends meet due to rising health insurance premiums, and local governments provide often the frontline response when uh, community members face medical debt bankruptcies or become gravely ill or even die needlessly because they lacked adequate health insurance. So all and all of this has become even more dire and more clear in the context of COVID-19. So um, more than 300 local efforts are underway in red, blue, and purple states and counties. We have 75 local resolutions have passed in cities and counties as diverse as Los Angeles, but then also Knoxville, Tennessee, and Philadelphia, and then South Bend, Indiana, and New Orleans, and Tampa, Florida, uh, Putney, Vermont, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Kalamazoo, Michigan, and actually just this week, the District of Columbia, the DC Council, uh, passed a resolution in support of Medicare for All following Prince George's County locally in, in Maryland, Montgomery County in Maryland. And so I just wanted to offer that it would be powerful for Virginia cities and counties to join that effort. Um, our, the coalition has a comprehensive toolkit a map where activists can plug into local efforts and see um, where, where that's happening around the country. So I just wanted to point out, and I can put in the chat, uh, MedicareForAllResolutions.org has a lot of um, the, the important importance for that. And, you know, and I think what's important with that is that it's incredible to see the enduring local coalitions that have been built through working together to pass resolutions in their towns. There's powerful testimony that patients and business owners and labor leaders and health providers have given at municipal hearings, um, local press attention, op-eds, letters to the editor, in district meetings with members of Congress that after that these local coalitions have engaged in. And that's really translated into broadening and deepening the movement and encouraging more members of Congress and to support Medicare for all legislation, to push for more hearings in Congress, to um, and, and to again, push back against a lot of the misinformation. So um, I just, I, I wanted to raise that and, and uh, as we launch into the Q&A, let's make sure that um, we, we need to get our arguments straight, but we also really need to build the power that we'll need to win. So I'll, I'll leave it there and welcome questions. Thank you, Melinda, all excellent points. Well, folks, it's been just been our privilege to hear several, several of our country's leaders and preeminent healthcare experts share their in-depth comprehensive analyses and insights about how to achieve universal healthcare coverage for all Americans. I hope you listened well and wrote thoughtful questions in the Q&A box to elicit their further insights, because now we're going to move into the second Q&A part of our program. Um, and uh, I asked my National Affairs Committee colleague, Andy Scalise, 
to monitor the Q&A box throughout the first of the pro part of the program and to sort and select some of your questions to ask the speakers. Also, after you registered your confirmation email, invited you to submit questions ahead through a linked form. Andy has been reviewing and will select has selected from among those questions as well. There won't be time to ask it, as you can see, uh, the content of the material that our panelists offered was so good, I didn't cut them off. <laughs> I let them go. I didn't want to miss a word of it. So there won't be as much time for Q&A. And when we get to the end of the time allotted, I, I may ask you if any of you want to stay on. But for now, let's go ahead. He He's going to try to identify the questions on topic, not duplicates, and try to address issues, aspects of the issues that haven't been considered or covered at all. And, and so, Andy, um, I'll break in when I need to. And uh, if you're ready, let's begin the Q&A. Thank you, Sandra. Um, our first question is for Dr. Berwick. And first of all, thank you, panelists, for, for an amazing discussion so far. But uh, Dr. Berwick, you, you once wrote, uh, and I'll quote, that the Affordable Care Act was an essential step forward, but covering all Americans through a single payer federal insurance program would now be a wiser path. Uh, I think you even said, President Obama has said it himself. It is now time for good new ideas like Medicare for all, end quote. So uh, you touched on this a little bit, but could you please explain specifically kind of why single payer healthcare system like Medicare for all is superior to the alternatives that we hear offered? And in particular, why, it, uh, why the public option may or may not be a viable alternative to single payer healthcare? Uh, sure. For, I don't want to oversimplify. This is complex, uh, but... Um, there are advantages to consolidating payment in a single channel, whether it's public or somehow a quasi-public channel. The first is uh, you get to reduce administrative costs. Uh, I think that would be substantial, as Bob Pollan has said. David Cutler at Harvard has estimated three to four hundred billion dollars a year in administrative costs. If you have a single payment system, those costs plummet, and uh, we need that money. That money has plenty of other uses. Second is advocacy. The more consolidated the payment system is, assuming it's publicly accountable and transparent, the more it can speak up on behalf of beneficiaries, patients, and the public needs. It can consolidate voice. I take as my example the opioid epidemic. We could have a decision to use the money in the healthcare system to fight the opioid epidemic. We can't make that decision right now. We could also have voice for shifting resources toward uh, upstream to the causes of illness that people have. So you get you kind of get a representation. When I showed up in my office in CMS every morning, I had to think about what the priorities were going to be for 110 million people, 60 million in Medicaid and 50 million in Medicare. And that's what I did. There's no, there's a single payer can do that. A multiple payer system doesn't. Third is it, it's easier for patients and families who then don't migrate among sources. And a lot of viscosity and cost get added for people when they migrate among uh, different parts of a very complex payment payment terrain. Uh, a fourth to me is, um, is public accountability. Transparency matters. And uh, you know the lights are on on Medicare. You can, you can do FOIAs and get information or Congress has oversight. It's not always pretty, but it's transparent. That's not true of the private system. The fifth is the toll. When you have a um, multi-payer system uh, in private hands as we do today, you have to think about the medical loss ratio and administrative costs and, um, and um, the, or the profit and overhead that are taken out of the system just because you have many different payers with different accountabilities. My overhead in Medicare was about maybe, well, it was technically 1%, but I always saw it was probably three or 4% because it included expenditures in labor and treasury and, and others. Um, so there's a lot of arguments. It's really hard to think about how to reduce costs dramatically without having a single payment channel. That's, that's sort of my belief. So that's some of the answers I could go on, but I know we have, we're short on time. Thank you. Yeah, I want to make sure that we get uh, some really good questions in there, and I really appreciate your perspective on that. Uh, we'll move to another question. Uh, this is this was one that was pretty popular among among the Q and A box, both uh, in advance and and in the and during the discussion tonight. So, Professor Pollan, uh, this this question is for you, and I'll kind of give some background. The, the Economic Policy Institute, uh, Josh Bivens, reports that uh, his studies countered the critics' assertion that there would be this massive job loss and economic drain on the country when you adopt a single payer healthcare system because of the transitional period. Um, he found that his job, that job losses during the transitional period would be, uh, quote, uh, relatively small, and that Medicare for all would be, quote, unambiguously positive uh, for the labor market in the United States, leading to 
again, quote, a boost in wages and salaries, as well as an increase in job quality while producing a net increase in jobs overall. Uh, one, just in general, do you concur with this analysis? Are there, are there any, anything that we need, we need to caveat? And, and perhaps more importantly, um, just judging by the, the comments in the, in the Q&A tonight, how, how do we explain this transition to, to, the, to the American people uh, who seem to be pretty skeptical about whether that would be successful for us? Okay, so uh, thanks very much for the question. I didn't have time to get into it in my remarks, but it's a really critical question. I know Josh Bivens very well. I respect him a lot. I respect a lot of the people at the Economic Policy Institute. I don't agree uh, with his conclusion on that. Uh, I think, you know, when we do economics, there's various levels at which we know things. Uh, some things we know very well because the effects are direct and straightforward. Some things are more diffuse. Uh, the thing that we know when we implement Medicare for all is that we are going to dramatically reduce administrative costs. We're gonna, the private health insurance system is out of business, okay, uh, altogether. In addition, at the offices of uh, healthcare providers, the degree of administrative uh, workers that are going to be doing the claims processing and so forth and validation, they also won't have much to do anymore. It's, I won't say it's down to zero, but that's the whole way we get savings. Let's acknowledge that. You don't get savings out of thin air. If we're going to get savings, that means we're gonna spend less money. And the main thing we're gonna spend less money on is having people do things that are wasteful. And that's why it, it's interesting. The, uh, the one part of my study that got a huge amount of attention, uh, for example, in, in Fox, news was my estimate that we're looking at a contraction of employment in the range of 2 million jobs. Now, uh, I, I think that, that that's my estimate as to the elimination of the private health insurance system and uh, the uh, contraction of, of jobs, administrative jobs in the area of the providers. Now, in our study, we actually spent a lot of time talking about the transition, uh, that these we're going to lose these jobs, we're going to move people into other levels of employment, we're going to guarantee their pensions, uh, we're going to guarantee their wages, we're going to re-employ them. Uh, those are things that we need to focus on. Now, when Josh Bivens uh, criticized our study, what he was talking about are things that um, could happen. Um, but you know, at, at, a, at a much lower level of certainty. In other words, we're, what, what Josh is talking about is, okay, we're moving to a more efficient healthcare system and that will enable businesses to expand and operate and doing other things. That means P also in addition, people will not have to, everyone is gonna have, spend less money on healthcare, they're gonna spend more money on other things. It also means that businesses won't have to spend so much money on shopping around for different healthcare private plans and worrying about that. They can focus on producing products. Um, I, I would broadly agree with Josh that the net effect of that uh, is likely to be enhancing, productivity enhancing, job enhancing, but nowhere near the level of certainty when we say we are getting rid of private health insurance and we're gonna save $400 billion. The only way that happens is if we're spending less money. You, you don't, you know, there is no trick here. So I will respectfully disagree with Josh. I don't know if he's listening now. I'm sure he is going to uh, dispute my, my uh, arguments, but I think it's actually pretty straightforward. And I think it's especially important for proponents like us, of Medicare for all to recognize the difficult challenges that we face on this. And the single biggest one I would say is that we get savings by reducing the wasteful employment. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a, what a lot of people have to say. Um, 
since the, the a couple of remaining questions are rather technical, um, I'd like to go to and and we may take more time past nine o'clock. I'd like to go to a question for our congressman, uh, Congressman Byer and Congressman Scott, real quick. Um, and again, I appreciate appreciate y'all here. The, the question we have is is we we, we kind of see that this idea of universal single payer health care is very popular with the American public, yet recent votes in Congress don't reflect the same level of support. Uh, of course, Congressman Byer and Scott, you both voted with your constituents and co sponsor HR 1976, the Medicare for All Act of 2021. Why do you think many of your colleagues in Congress aren't in line with the popular opinion on this? Um, what are you doing to bring them along? And then what can we do to help you bring them along? Let me defer to Chairman Scott, if I can. Well, and I'll okay. pile on. I think we are, one of the uh, concerns is the transition. We know where we want to end up, but the problem with ending up there immediately is that the message that a politician would have to deliver is, I'm going to raise your taxes $3 trillion. You're going to drop your insurance and trust us there'll be better insurance in the end. Um, I'm not sure how many people want to run on that platform. What we have done and what a credible path to the, to, to where we all want to be is to continue. One, we got to get a public option as, as, on, the, um, uh, on the Affordable Care Act. We have to expand who can buy into it to include employers. Uh, but we, and we also need to start increasing gradually uh, the um, like we like we did last year, like we're trying to do now, we went from nine and a half to eight and a half percent. The maximum portion of your income going to uh, go, going to um, insurance, um, seven and a half, six and a half. Uh, we're going to eventually have to end up paying three trillion. But if you do it gradually, you can see how you can get there. You're not scaring people. Uh, and you can get there. The Medicare for All legislation shows us as we get closer where we actually, how, how this thing is gonna work. Um, the public option, as we've heard, is really unfair competition and will absorb such a market share that um, who, would, who would spend 10% more to get a worse product? it will absorb a larger and larger market share. So all of the economies of scale that have been mentioned can, can start be, uh, being realized. And the private insurance will essentially wither on the vine. Um, I think if we keep going in that direction, direction and keep pushing, we have to make sure we don't go backwards. A lot of these uh, improvements we made in the Affordable Care Act are temporary. So we gotta put up some money to keep it going. Uh, so we don't go backwards and lose the progress we've made. But if we keep pushing forward, I think um, the, the, the speed with which we go is how quick we can come up with the money. Uh, but we're going in the right direction and the Medicare for all legislation shows us where we're gonna end up. And all I would add to that is politics is the art of the possible. I'd love to move as fast as we possibly can, but people still feel very burned by the 65 seats we lost in 2010 after the Affordable Care Act fight. And rightly or wrongly blame a lot of those losses on that fight. As uh, Congressman Scott says too, even the Progressive Caucus led by Pramila Jayapal this year was trying to do Medicare to age 62 or age 60. You know, an incremental step to get us there as fast as we can. And uh, we, we will keep the pressure on. By the way, um, Elected members of Congress are constantly worried about getting reelected. And so anytime they do something really brave, um, you either have to be in a pretty safe seat or have a lot of courage. <laughs> but there's we have 32 frontliners who are trying not to do anything that will make them lose. And then we don't want them to lose either because we have a three vote margin. Thank you, Congress. I would like to just follow up with, with you both, just uh, because I, it is something a lot of people ask, and, and it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for you to, to suggest it. I mean, what can we do? What can we do to, to help your cause here? So the very first thing we can do is elect more senators, um, because even 
if we had 200 House members co-sponsoring H.R. 1976, if it goes to a Senate where you need 60 votes, it's not happening. So we need to get rid of the filibuster. And I think that's um, sine qua non for this progress. Okay, thank you both. Um, I have two more questions, again, a little bit more technical. And uh, and, and really, I, I Sandra, I, I would like to open it up to, to kind of all of the experts on the panel because everybody kind of mentioned Med Medicare at some point in their in their presentations tonight. And a very specific question we got was regarding Medicare Advantage and how it's essentially a feels like a Trojan horse to privatize Medicare. Many reports, uh, an in-depth investigative report from the Center for Public Integrity in 2014, a 2016 GAO report, 2019 HHS report, uh, all found that these privatized plans cost Medicare far more than the original Medicare, uh, ripping taxpayers off to the tune of billions of dollars a month while providing less health care than the original Medicare and Medigap plans. These reports also revealed that uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are failing to recoup billions of dollars of improper payments and instead are promoting these plans. Uh, specifically, if passed, how do the provisions uh, to expand Medicare under the Build Back Better bill uh, not just fall prey to this escalating privatization? And do these, do these make single-payer healthcare systems like Medicare for All even more difficult to implement? Who wants to take this first? Professor Fader. Yeah, there's no question that um, private plans in Medicare are, are were designed to and encouraged to undermine traditional Medicare. If they came in when we passed the, um, the law that expanded uh, drug coverage only privately in Medicare and the plans were, private plans were bribed to come in. Those bribes have been reduced, but there's plenty of evidence that the incentives those plans are given to upcode, which means to um, exaggerate the diagnoses of their conditions of their beneficiaries are, get, are getting them overpaid um, relative to what would be paid in traditional Medicare, uh, and that they are, although they can give extra benefits, they're giving benefits to attract people, to attract the healthier population, people who, when they're sick, they want to go back um, to traditional Medicare and can't in every state because they can't always get Medigap. So I can't speak to what is in reconciliation, what I would like to see in reconciliation is that we pull back those overpayments and essentially improve benefits, which is in proposals for reconciliation, improve the benefits in traditional Medicare so that we don't continue to advantage private plans and make them look more attractive. So that we got almost, I think it's roughly now 40% of beneficiaries are in those plans. But, and the Trump administration was biased, continued to be biased in terms of explaining Medicare and you, the book they put out, um, explaining what your choices were. But I think we've come, we've moved back from that and we have to strengthen traditional Medicare and stop the bribery that's going on in those private plans. Thanks, Judy. Uh, Dr. Bergwick has his hand up. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, the um, I posted in the chat a um, paper that is timely, I guess. I uh, wrote it with Rick Gilfill in, in Health Affairs last week. There's a two-part paper on Medicare Advantage and direct contracting. Uh, without getting into the weeds, this is it, the paper is very technical, but it attempts to do exactly, to understand exactly what Dr. Professor Fader was saying. She is absolutely right, right on the money. Medicare Advantage, the original idea was a good idea which is to bring the benefits of carefully managed care, not, not scam care, not withholding care, but really thinking hard about what my brother needs now that he's in the hospital and managing his whole trajectory into Medicare. But it went way off the tracks and now it is uh, privatization of Medicare. It's, uh, med it's insurance companies taking a big swipe, a big swath of money off out of the Medicare system into private hands. There's no evidence of better care systematically, and there's a lot of evidence of higher cost to the tune of about well over $100 billion over the past 10 years. And uh, Rick Kronick's recent paper projects that 
the uh, upcoding that's going on in Medicare Advantage will cost us over $300 billion in the next decade. And we're looking for pay for us for, for social determinants of health. There's a big one, which Congress would need a lot of guts to go for. Um, the other thing is the extension under the Trump administration of privatization through the so-called direct contracting mode, which was regulation prepared in the Trump administration and then came out in the Biden in, the, in January. Uh, I think there's now realization this is a bad idea, uh, a privatization of traditional Medicare, and we're going to have to really rethink it. We need the benefits of actually managing care in the, in the right way for patients, but not the overhead of having private insurance enter the Medicare system. That's my view. Dr. Berwick, thank you. I think uh, Andy does have a question on direct contracting. And uh, I think, ask the question, because I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. It's stealth. Nobody knows it. Very few people know it's happening. Yeah, you're, 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 basically, you're, you're basically reading the question because I know you, you got to read through these earlier. But um, I'm going to read it the way it was written for us. Uh, so, so, so Wall Street private equity firms and other billionaire players are rushing into the healthcare scene um, and, and through a privatization scheme uh, known as direct contracting entities or DCEs. And, and as you said, Sandra, the public really knows very little about them. And it's, uh, these are being piloted now by CMS. Um, if not stopped, it seems like these would essentially fully privatize Medicare and it, it, by extension, any, anything in the Build Back Better bill related to Medicare as well. Um, could you please, and, and I guess Dr. Berwick, this would be for you then, uh, but, but also anybody else who, who knows about these uh, better than we do, um, would you be able to explain a little bit about direct contracting entities, kind of what they are, and then the danger they, they would pose to a universal single-payer healthcare system like Medicare for All? And how do we expose this? Because, uh, again, this is something that I think a lot of people, Dr. Berwick, when you said direct contracting, not everybody here even heard about it before. So it would be really helpful to, to learn how do we expose these to a wider audience. Thanks, Andrew. Well... Complexity is in our way. One of the reasons the system doesn't change is it's been built for complexity. And so it's really hard to explain to the public. I ran Medicare and I don't understand a lot of it, I must say. But direct con here's what direct contracting is. If you look at the Medicare population, about 40 or 42% of them are now covered by private insurance plans. That's Medicare Advantage, part C, where the government doesn't pay for your care. It pays an insurance company to then cover your care through a health plan, it's privatization. It was originally intended to introduce good management into care. Instead, it's introduced high profits, a lot of extra cost, and not a lot of uh, not a lot of uh, evidence of beneficial care. In the Trump administration, the idea surfaced. It wasn't a totally new idea. It was well, gee, how can we move that dynamic? The government, instead of paying directly, would insert an intermediary, and the government pays the intermediary for care of a population of patients. The original idea was the intermediary that the government would pay would be would be deliverers of care, like a primary care group or group of physicians who then get a, a pot of money to take care of a population. Getting out is the fee-for-service durable cage. Fee-for-service is not a very good way to pay for care. What happened was that the uh, government, the Trump administration opened the idea that the intermediary, instead of being caregivers, doctors, let's say, could be an insurance company or a venture capitalist that could then say, hey, everybody, I'll take care of this population of people. Government, you pay me and I'll take care of them. That's Medicare Advantage on the traditional Medicare side in, in, in disguise. It was called direct contracting. I call that an Orwellian title because it's exactly the opposite. It was inserting an indirect contractor between the government and the, and the, and the uh, providers of care and the patients. Um, right now, the first tranche of direct contracting entities have been approved. There are 53 of them. Uh, only about five or six are really insurance companies, but they actually will have the bulk of the patients under their coverage. Uh, 20 million people will be eligible under the insurer, under insurers if, if that were to go full bore. It is a, it's a very bad move to privatize traditional Medicare and get an intermediary in there. What will happen? Higher costs, overhead costs, uh, restrictions of care, uh, and all of the problems we see in Medicare Advantage introduced on the traditional side. You're right, it's stealth. I don't think it's very hard to explain that. Um, the public may not get it, but it's a bad move. Luckily, I think, um, I believe the Trump, the Biden administration is kind of waking up to that. And, and if they do the right thing, they'll, they'll slow this process down, maybe even find a way to stop it right now while we work ahead on other ways to give providers of care um, global budgets to take care of populations. So they're, they're not doing just, they don't have to do just fee-for-service medicine. 
Uh, I, I'll say one other comment. I always worked as a pediatrician in a globally budgeted system, the Harvard Community Health Plan, the HMO, and it was fabulous. I could get people what they needed because I didn't have to kind of keep the fee-for-service gerbil cage working, but it was really clear who I worked for. I worked for the patients and not for an insurance company. Uh, thank you, Dr. Berwick. Uh, I, we, of course, and we knew this would happen because the topic is so fascinatingly complex, as you say, and, and we have so much information that we, we want to be delivered. Um, but I wanted to, I don't know what the time frame is of people on this call. We had set a stop at nine, uh, but I did want to let, uh, I don't know, uh, Congressman Byer, Congressman Scott, do you have a sharp stop at nine or do you, can you stay with us a little bit more? What's your preference? And then if you can, I'd love to hear uh, you both comment about the, these issues with the Advantage plans and the direct contracting entities, if you would like to remark about that. First of all, what's your time frame? Starting with, Dr., uh, with Representative Beyer. Um, I need to go soon, um, only because I have another three hours of work to do tonight. <laughs> Would you like to then comment on this or make any yeah, just final briefly. remarks? First of all, I thank you so much, Sandra, for putting this together. I've learned a great deal tonight. Um, your, your panelists were terrific, and especially you know, the deep dive. Just Dr. Berwick's um, laying out of all the things that would be saved by going to single payer was, was very um, cogent, powerful. Uh, and my great fear, building what Dr. Berwick said about the uh, the, the direct payment system the uh, it is mirroring what's happened with private equity in insurance room insurance uh, in emergency rooms um, that when you put the profit goal as the only goal as we have seen in corporate America where the maximizing shareholder value has made everything else perverse um, you get the worst kinds of, of um, outcomes and um, so I, I'm very much hope that the Biden administration wakes up to that and that we in Congress can do what we can to keep the disaster from happening. Thank you so much. Uh, Congressman, uh, before you have to go, do you want to make any other remarks? Um, only thank you. Um, and, and to please hang in there, we will get to universal health care and Medicare for all and a single payer system. It makes the most sense. Uh, as so many of your speakers have detailed carefully tonight. We spend way too much money for way too poor a performance and we can do much better. And this is the right thing. We, and uh, Congressman Scott and I have to continue to bring our colleagues along as quickly as we can. Thank you so much. I'm gonna ask uh, Congressman Scott the same thing. Do you have a uh, hard finish here? And would you like to comment on the last question and make any final remarks? Let us know where you stand on well, all of that. <laughs> Well, let me just um, follow, follow up with what uh, Don just said. When you allow private for profit uh, considerations, you end up with bad results. That's why a single payer plan is so valuable because you get rid of all that. You get that out, 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 out of the system. And I think um, our challenge is to continue to make progress towards say, a universal uh, single payer system. And we're making progress. Uh, it's it's um, one of the problems is that the transition is expensive, but overall society will save money. And um, we, like I said, we got from nine and a half percent to eight and a half percent, seven and a half percent if we keep going. Uh, and it's not it's not too far away where you get down to zero. We have to have a public option on the menu of um, options for on the Affordable Care Act. And I think, as I said, that would get such a overwhelming market share. Uh, that that will accelerate the um, progress towards uh, towards a single payer. Um, that 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 said, we've we've got got a lot of work to do. Uh, we need to keep going. Um, it's it's challenging, and you've got a lot of um, um, uh, you, you've got a lot of interest. Is uh, it's been pointed out if you cut out uh, ten percent of the overhead, somebody's losing a job, and they don't like it, so they're going to. Uh, push back, but I think the fact that um, you're going to eliminate 10% of the cost of um, health care, I, th I think you have to categorize that as a good thing, and you get that by going to a um, uh, public option 
uh, and gets us headed towards the um, uh, towards the goal of um, of, of universal health care. Um, so, I, Sandra, and I want to thank you and and the experts. It's been um, very informative, uh, very informative panel, and uh, we just have to keep going in the direction we're going. We're going to get there. Thank you so much, Congressman. Um, I. I would like to ask our, do any of our, pan, do all of our panelists need to leave? If you're available to stay a little longer to answer another question, you're welcome to do so. I think what I'll do, because we have reached the time limit of the official uh, forum uh, uh, timing, I'm going to kind of close the official uh, forum and so that those who need to leave who can. Uh, and I'd like to say on behalf, and then if you could stay for a little after, after chat, that would be great. On behalf of the FCDC National Affairs Committee host and our Virginia statewide Democratic Committee co-sponsors, I want to thank our eminent panelists for your contributions to our knowledge and for your efforts to move our country to the universal healthcare destination we all, think, we all seek. I also thank our audience for your attention and your future activism to help us on the journey. Of course, as Professor Fader emphasized so well, we can't do any of this unless Democrats win our elections. We know that. The Democratic Party is the only party that cares about your health care. We do know that. And we in Virginia have an important election in, Virginia in this year, and the polls are open now for early voting. So Virginians get out there and vote. Um, and I want to say to those of you in the audience, uh, what do you think? Can you see USPHC in our future? I hope so. Let's get the work done. And uh, this completes our official forum. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we wish you good night and good health care for everyone who has to leave. And we'll hold a few minutes for those who have to depart. And if any of our panelists and, and uh, audience wants to stay for maybe one or two more questions, we welcome them to do so. Thank you so much. <laughs>